If you want to get somebody's attention or a group of people, you whisper. A parent knows that, and um, a teacher knows that. And in the gospel today, Jesus said these words, but he was whispering them. Because Nicodemus, who, to whom he's talking, uh, was uh, somebody who visited Jesus, we're told, at night. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a political animal. Uh, he had a lot of uh, authority and power. He was intrigued with Jesus, but he didn't want to be seen with him publicly. He was still hedging his bets. And um, our Lord spent quite a bit of time with him because what we just heard is just part of this whispering conversation at night. Jesus had throngs and throngs of people to whom he spoke. The Sermon on the Mount, if you go to the Holy Land, it's on a, where they think it happened. Uh, it's like a real big valley and there's a top on a bluff. And they think he used it as an amphitheater before microphones, of course, so that he could be heard. We know that he fed 5,000, and they were just the men. So he was used to talking to a lot of people. And in between, had conversations with smaller groups of people. But this one is recorded as a singular conversation at night. If it was at night, I think they had a whisper because he Nicodemus did not want to be seen and or heard. He was inquisitive. He was attracted to Jesus because he, as is described in another place, he taught with authority and not like the scribes and the Pharisees who just went on and said what they were supposed to say. But he had some integrity and authority and authenticity but he couldn't quite make the move that Jesus is the Messiah. And so our Lord speaks about a number of things. Now it's just maybe two weeks before he's going to be crucified. That's the reason why the church gives us this gospel now. We're two weeks away from Holy Week. So, uh, so he must have been following him in a sense of hearing about him and then maybe starting to see him at night, quietly. Uh, and um, we're told in the gospel today, in this part, that he's trying to explain what's going to happen by something that he would be familiar with. And what was he familiar with as a Jew? The story of Moses holding up what they call a seraph serpent. Uh, the Jews were being bitten by snakes, poisoned. And God told him, uh, Moses, to put a snake, of all things, the very thing that was doing the damage, on a pole. And of course, if you ever see the letterhead of a medical person or a medical team, they have this symbol right from the Bible, of a cross with a serpent around it. It comes from this incident in the Old Testament. And God told Moses, the very thing that is hurting you is the very thing that can heal you. It was a, a prediction of Christ on the cross. The very thing, death, that happened to him would be the very thing that would prove eternal life for us individually and for the life of the human race. So it's meant to be a sort of like a mixed signal in a way. This looks like utter defeat, failure. Many people who don't understand this at all will say, why, why are all of you for 2000 years honoring somebody who failed in human terms? So the irony, the biblical irony both with Moses, with the serpent, and Christ on the cross, is trying to tell us that God uses 
things that we don't understand beyond our superficiality to give us insight about what is eternal and how we should live now. Uh, and uh, our Lord is whispering this to Nicodemus. Just like Moses lifted the serpent, so will the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him and looks upon him may have eternal life. The whispering, I think, is very important because he, up until then, he didn't speak about this itself. But he trusted Nicodemus, who was curious enough. And then the conversation ended. The next time we pick up Nicodemus is with another man called Joseph of Arimathea. And these two men had the courage, he was a secret believer too, for much the same reason as Nicodemus. Um, and they wound up going to Pilate of all people, the politician of all politicians then, and asked for the body of Jesus after he had died. That was an act of courage. It was an act of faith, especially for two men who had been trying to hedge their bets. The apostles fled and away from him. Only his mother and a few others were there at the ultimate moment of failure. But these two fellows, after it was quite obvious that it was a total failure in human terms, had the courage to ask for the body. And they took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and put it in a tomb, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Well, that's the kind of disciples they were. Our Lord had a, a, the whole spectrum of believers. He had the whole spectrum of human nature. He still does. There are those that are not, absolutely. There are those that are hedging their bets. And there are those who are committed. And then those who are committed and courageous to be seen as a believer of Christ, risen from the dead. And he deals with all of them in his own time on earth and since he went to heaven. He deals with all of us. Sometimes where any one of them or some of them, as we go through our earthly journey and our journey of faith, this Lent might call some people to consider him like Nicodemus and give it a go. Some people might walk away from him in this Lent. Uh, some people might very well say, well, I'm going to hedge my bets and just say he was a good guy in history. So after this pandemic, I don't really see myself going back to Mass. Um, I can go to the mall. I can go to the shore. <laughs> I can start going to weddings, and, but not that. And then there are others who have been faithful, if not bodily in coming to Mass, but by reason of all kinds of media. And then there are those who, as things develop in their life and in this crazy time, say, I am publicly witnessing to Jesus, not just by coming back to Mass, but also by giving the example of truly sticking out like a sore thumb. That's what Christians are meant to do, stick out like a sore thumb. And Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were not ready at that time to stick out like a sore thumb. But if they wound up on Good Friday doing what the apostles should have done, they were believers. They had jumped over and they had committed themselves publicly. At the worst moment, it was the most non-political moment to do that. And they did it carefully and respectfully and with great faith. We uh, honor that in the 13th station of the cross over there, 
where the body of Jesus is taken down. So Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are good examples of what it means to move past a curiosity. We've all had that in our life about our faith, maybe when we were younger and all, and then to take the step, and you all have been taking the step over and practicing faith. And sometimes at the most abysmal moments in your life and in mine. And sometimes it happens to the whole lot of us, the whole lot of us in this world with this current situation. That it can be very, very, very difficult with loss of life of others, ourselves maybe, health, normality, a life that we were used to. And we hopefully take the step to say, despite it all, I know that my Redeemer lives and he's going to see me, us, through this. And I'm willing to state it publicly in the way that I live. And then maybe sometimes bear the consequences of that public witness. We don't know what happened to Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus after that. They probably were not very welcomed back into the Sanhedrin. We don't know, but probably. And, um, they, but they took the step. So they are examples, especially Nicodemus, of what it means to move on and to progress. And perhaps there are people here or elsewhere that are on that journey of beyond curiosity about Jesus, even beyond believing in him, going to belief into action in our life. And if we're living faithfully our marriage, our family life, our profession, we live with, some, with honesty and chastity and integrity, and we fail once in a while, uh, we're, we're trying to keep up with them. We're following him. And his cross for us is not a symbol of failure, but it's a cross of victory proven by the Easter Sunday event that changed the world and caused the church to say, it's not over when you think it's over. In a particular instance in our life or in the life of the world. So wherever you may be in your life right now, here or at home, uh, we should think of Nicodemus today and Joseph of Arimathea and say, they, they took it seriously enough to take the plunge. And I need to take the plunge in a greater connection with Christ. I have one, perhaps, God willing. You do, I'm sure. But a greater attachment to Christ, a more conscious one, in which he can converse with us in whispering like he did with Nicodemus. It's called prayer. And not just speaking, but listening. Nicodemus asked very few questions. Jesus did all the talking. And because it was in the quiet of the night, uh, when it was just him and Nicodemus, that that would happen to us. In God's own way, he speaks back to us. And usually in silence. I'm a great believer in that, how God can speak back to us in what I call the limbo time of going to sleep every night. Everybody in the world, no matter if they're sleeping on a mat or on a luxurious bed, you have that time before, after you put your head down on the pillow and before you fall asleep, that time. Many people make it, what they're thinking about, a monologue. I gotta do this, I gotta do that. I don't know about the mortgage, da 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 da. It's the reason why they don't always go to sleep right away. But we are invited to make it a dialogue. Say all those things that are burdening us, but to him, make it a conversation. You'll fall asleep and you won't maybe get an answer right away, but you'll get an answer eventually because like Nicodemus, you go just with him. You can go other times, but it's a universal time where God invites us 
into another phase of life called sleep, and before we do, to lay everything before him. And he will tell us what he needs to say to us in the silence and in the silence of our hearts and in the answers that become very apparent from our prayers. May God bless you all.